There are still many mysteries shrouded in the depths of our nation's rivers. Their winding, sinewy waters have carved trails through time, stirring reflections of an elusive past. Their turbid depths seem void of life, but are alive with nature's miracles, a diversity of simple and complex organisms that inhabit this beautiful, yet seemingly ominous underwater world. There is still so much to learn about our nation's rivers, about the ancient survivors who have inhabited these waters long before dinosaurs roamed the earth. Prehistoric relics cloaked in the secrets of an enigmatic past. We marvel at the sheer thought of their existence and wonder at the possibility there may be more. But of all the river inhabitants we know exist, there is one that demands a closer look, a primitive, bizarre-looking creature indigenous to the United States and the only living species of its kind, the paddlefish, a Missouri treasure. The paddlefish, Polyodon spatula. Fishermen call them spoonbill cats, but paddlefish aren't related to catfish at all. There is only one other species of fish in the Polyodontidae family, the Chinese paddlefish, an endangered species native to the Yangtze River Basin in China. Paddlefish are one of the largest freshwater fish in the United States. Their name comes from their paddle-shaped rostrum whose exact purpose scientists and biologists still don't fully understand. A popular theory is that it's a balancing mechanism for swimming in strong currents and also used as a sensory device to locate swarms of zooplankton, which is the paddlefish's primary diet. Paddlefish are filter feeders and are often referred to as freshwater whales. They are smooth-skinned and entirely cartilaginous, with the exception of the dentary, or jawbone. Historically, paddlefish were widespread and inhabited most of the large rivers of the Mississippi River drainage but not anymore. They've been extirpated from much of their peripheral range to include the Great Lakes and Canada, New York, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. And there is growing concern about their populations in other states. Research biologist Kim Graham with the Missouri Department of Conservation has worked with paddlefish for over 25 years and is one of the leading authorities on the species. His years of research have targeted some of the primary causes for the decline in paddlefish populations. It's unfortunate to say, but almost all of the problems are related to man. Pollution, uh, construction of dams on, on rivers, alteration of the rivers themselves, overfishing. It's, it's all man-made, and it's all, all done by man. For instance, in the early, early 1900s, Lake sturgeon in the Midwest were terribly overharvested, and the populations almost extirpated. Uh, because of the demand for the roe, for caviar, and for the outstanding flesh that both the sturgeon and the paddlefish have, once the lake sturgeon populations were diminished to the point that they were no longer there in numbers that was feasible to fish for them, the paddlefish became the prime target. Uh, paddlefish populations were really exploited heavily in the early 1900s in the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. We're talking about hundreds of tons of, of fish a year. And in a matter of 20 or 30 years, you know, they, were, they were pretty well knocked down to the point that it, there really weren't that many fish left. And it was about that same time then that man started altering the big rivers. Uh, barge traffic became a, a thing that man started wanting to do. We started narrowing the rivers to get the water off the country faster, uh, putting in wing dikes, destroying all kinds of habitat. And all of these things were compounding factors, and they, none of them were good for the paddlefish. In the 1980s, paddlefish populations were once again noticeably on the decline, particularly in Missouri and Tennessee. During that time, there was an embargo on Iranian shipments because of the hostage crisis in Iran. There was also a boycott on Soviet products over the invasion of Afghanistan. These trade restrictions cut off American caviar producers from their supply of the highly prized sturgeon caviar from the Caspian Sea. Producers needed a substitute, 
something of quality that would pass the test of the social elite where these salty little black pearls would find the most discriminating palates and the money to back them up. Paddlefish eggs were a likely substitute because they closely resembled the eggs of the Caspian Cervruga sturgeon in size, color, and taste. The potential was there. All that was needed was the right marketing strategy before anyone realized the demand was overwhelming the supply. The price for paddlefish caviar soared and often sold under the title of American Sturgeon Caviar in some of the finest specialty stores in New York and Dallas, retailing for as much as $238 a 14-ounce tin, which is the typical weight of a caviar pound. It was still a great deal less than the rare Beluga Caviar, but held its own with the Russian Sevruga. Paddlefish Caviar was making news. Articles appeared in major newspapers such as USA Today and the Wall Street Journal. One feature was brought to the attention of federal agents and led them to believe there was a group in Missouri that was illegally commercializing paddlefish roe. Our first indication that, that we were having problems in Missouri occurred about 1985, 86, 87, when fishermen began telling us that, hey, all we're catching are small paddlefish. We're not catching the large ones anymore, particularly the females. At least the numbers were going down. Our biological information, our surveys, kind of showed the same thing. It was at this time that a federal and state investigation started. Supervisory Special Agent Larry Keck with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife's Law Enforcement Division gathered and analyzed intelligence data from several states, all relating to illegal paddlefish commercialization. He coordinated an investigation and assigned two of his special agents to a covert operation in Missouri. Bob Lamadou was one of those agents. He and Special Agent Manny Medina were first to go undercover, disguised as poachers. These people were serious about what they did. When we first got in with them and got in undercover with them, they told myself and the other agents involved that if they did find out we were agents, that uh, you know they would kill us. And we had no doubt that uh, they meant what they said. Uh, not only did they all carry guns, but it was very dangerous being out there with them at night on the waters because we knew that uh, they could simply push an agent overboard and uh, hold them down with an oar or simply throw a net over them and then just say that uh, it was an accident. These people were in this for one thing, and that was for the money. Uh, they talked about caviar as black gold, and they were up there without any regard to the resource or what they were doing to the paddlefish population or anyone who got in their way. The poachers used long nets with 10-inch mesh as part of their arsenal to rape the rivers. They kept the nets hidden along the river bank until they were ready to move in, then worked quickly and quietly, stealing through the night stringing their death traps in such a way they'd seal off an entire arm of the river. The nets didn't discriminate against species, so literally hundreds of big fish were trapped in the nets each night. Catfish, gar, and of course, the prized paddlefish. There wasn't time to distinguish males from females during the frenzied search for black gold. Paddlefish were slaughtered in numbers that uh, uh, at times made myself and the other agents involved sick. Any fish that we caught of any size uh, was slit to see if in fact it had eggs or not. The river turned red with blood. How many subjects we got? Got three. I have seen white buckets that appeared to have eggs, and I've also seen a pub that looked like it had an ad in it. We got a probable cause. 10-4. Any weapons? Have not seen any. 10-4. We're to give us a word when they get up out of the water. Okay. 
As part of a joint investigation, Missouri conservation agent Steve Nichols was assigned to the case, bringing the total to three that were working undercover. The covert phase of the operation took 18 months. At takedown, seven subjects were arrested, and 10 federal and state search warrants were served in southwest Missouri. Another gun. Here you go, John. 23 people were arrested, charged, and successfully prosecuted in state court in Missouri. On a federal level, the U.S. Attorney's Office was relentless in their prosecution and took strong positions on the wildlife charges. Six defendants pled guilty to felony charges of interstate trafficking in wildlife. They were fined and sentenced to time in federal prison. The hard work, dedication, and courage of state and federal officials paid off in a big way. Federal Judge Alan Edgar, who presided over the felony offenders in Chattanooga, Tennessee, was very direct with his response, to their surprise, at receiving prison sentences. We can no longer tolerate the destruction of our nation's natural resources for the short-term profit of a few. Paddlefish is an animal that can live to extremely long ages. Uh, they can commonly live 20 to 30 years old. They don't mature. The females, for instance, don't mature until they're 10 to 12 years old and the males 6 to 7. They, the females don't spawn each year. Uh, they have periodi periodicities of 2 to 3 years in their spawning cycles. Uh, their spawning requirements are very, very exacting. Three things must occur before paddlefish will spawn. The water temperature must be from 55 to 60 degrees. The photo period, which occurs in spring, must be just right. And there must be a proper rise in the river. It takes the precise timing of all three of those events. Historically, paddlefish did not spawn every year because all of those things only occurred about every four or five years. Where and how they reproduce is still pretty much a mystery. There's probably only a handful of biologists that have ever seen a paddlefish reproduce naturally. It's just, it's not that well known and it's still a deep dark secret in a lot of states today. But we've, we noticed on the gravel bars that, the, that were so important in Missouri before Truman Dam was impounded that usually one female, which is 70, 80, 90 pounds, it just depends on her size, is accompanied anywhere from two to five or six males. They're broadcast spawners. Uh, the males accompany her, swimming alongside of her, and as she releases her eggs, they release their milt simultaneously, and the milt attach, uh, uh, attaches to that egg and penetrates it and fertilizes it, and at the same time, the egg attaches to the, to the rock or the, the rocky substrate uh, on that spawning bar. Dams have had detrimental effects on paddlefish. They block upstream movement to ancestral spawning grounds and seriously modify water temperatures and downstream flow patterns. Hydropower dams can be particularly damaging because as paddlefish attempt to move upstream during the spring spawning season, their rostrums are often severely damaged, some even severed. We began our study before Truman was actually impounded because we could anticipate some of the problems that were going to occur. Uh, and they did. When the dam was impounded in 1977, it flooded the only known spawning areas, really, in the United States. We know they spawn a lot of other places, but it was the only known spawning areas. We feel that probably that area that's now impounded by that reservoir, it probably produced 80 or 90 percent of all the young paddlefish that, were, that occurred in the Osage River Basin. So we have to develop management plans now to maintain our populations and maintain sport fisheries because if we didn't do those kinds of things, our populations would uh, eventually diminish over a 15 or 20 year period and they would probably be extirpated in, in a lot of areas in our state. Hatchery stocks play an important role in fisheries management, particularly in areas where there is little to no natural spawn, as in the case of Missouri's paddlefish. 
we don't like to restock anything. You know, I always had the feeling if Mother Nature can do it, let's, that's the best way. Uh, but we are forced in this situation to stock our, our fisheries each year with fingerling fish. And our concern is maintaining that genetic integrity. And that's something that you never know that you're quite doing the right thing. But we try to, for instance, use as many males and females as we can because we want to keep that genetics in good shape. We don't want to end up with one genetic line, for instance. We want to maintain good diversities. The Blind Pony Hatchery in Sweet Springs, Missouri, raises some 30,000 paddlefish fingerlings each year for restocking. They also supply fingerlings to other states that may need them for reclamation projects or to supplement existing restocking programs. Typically, hatcheries keep their paddlefish fry in troughs or raceways where pond water is constantly cycled or they're kept in fertilized ponds that are rich in zooplankton, their favorite food. Either way, they can easily be converted to an artificial diet, which they accept readily. Young paddlefish are reared until they are approximately 12 to 14 inches long and then stocked in lakes and reservoirs. At that size, they are better able to escape predation and can fend for themselves. Harvest time is usually in late September or early October. Ponds are drained, forcing the young paddlefish into a concrete kettle where they're netted and culled. The fish are placed into aerated tanks for transport. Once at the lake, the restocking procedure goes quickly, and a new generation of paddlefish is well on its way. However, before any restocking can even take place, there must be eggs, and they must be fertilized. Missouri actually did the pioneering work on artificial propagation of paddlefish. We began in the early to mid 1960s and at that time developed techniques that we were able to use to spawn, grow, and, and later stock young paddlefish into reservoirs. It had never been done prior to that. In 1986, we were fortunate enough to seek the advice of Dr. Serge Dorshoff from the University of California in Davis, who was a, a pioneer in sturgeon work on the West Coast. And he taught us some techniques that he, was, he had developed for the use in white sturgeon in the West that are very applicable to paddlefish, because those two species are quite similar. And the technique that really improved our technology for spawning and made it really an art is the fact that he taught us to use cesarean section for taking eggs. Jerry Hamilton is one of the leading experts on the artificial propagation of paddlefish. He is the hatchery manager at Blind Pony and every spring works round the clock to ensure a healthy and successful spawn. We're spawning paddlefish, stripping eggs, hand stripping eggs. That's the way we used to take all the eggs. That's the old method. But what we're actually doing it for now is to make sure that she has ovulated all of her eggs inside of her body cavity. We don't want to go ahead and C-section and take the eggs until we're sure she's ovulated all the eggs off of her ovary. Prior to performing the C-section, the eggs are first staged, whereby a small sample is removed, hard-boiled, and then analyzed to determine stage of development. Okay, we have determined that the fish has ovulated all of her eggs. We're gonna run water now through her gills to keep her alive just alternate from one side to the other. Pour it on a disinfectant, disinfect the area. That small incision there is where we took the egg sample to stage the eggs. Here we go. After egg removal, the incision is sutured and the female is put in a holding tank to recuperate. She's later transferred to a hatchery pond until fully recovered, then released back into the wild. Yeah. 
Milt is extracted from the males, then used to fertilize the eggs. The fertilized eggs are delicately stirred with a feather in a special solution of clay and water to neutralize adhesion. By nature, paddlefish eggs are extremely sticky in order to adhere to the gravel substrate in rivers. But in a hatchery situation, it could prove detrimental and cause fungus problems. The eggs are then water hardened and put into hatching jars for the next five to seven days for incubation. They're slightly agitated and kept well oxygenated in a controlled environment. Transformation from embryo to larva happens rather quickly. The first noticeable difference is development of the notochord, usually within 24 hours. By day five, they're almost ready to hatch, and many do. You can see blood circulating through these tiny, transparent little miracles. They live off their yolk sac for the first few days of life, and must find food quickly if they are to survive. Under natural conditions, they're dependent on the river current to carry them back into fertile nursery areas where they can feed and grow. All natural reproduction of paddlefish in the Osage River Basin, as well as in other parts of Missouri, has been lost because of the construction of dams and the destruction of habitat as a result of man's attempt to tame and mold our natural rivers. In an effort to assist Mother Nature, the Missouri Department of Conservation has been rearing large numbers of paddlefish in state hatcheries and has instituted a restocking program in order to maintain successful sport fisheries. Paddlefish are an important sport fish in Missouri. Thousands of these freshwater giants are harvested each spring during the sport snagging season and commonly weigh in excess of 50 pounds. The current Missouri state record stands at a whopping 130 pounds. One reason paddlefish are such a prized catch is the outstanding flavor of the meat, which is a firm, white, boneless flesh, low in fat and calories, and deliciously similar to ocean swordfish and halibut. It's important that fishery managers monitor their paddlefish to maintain healthy, thriving populations. Paddlefish are not only a valuable natural resource, but they're an integral part of the Big River landscape and truly a Missouri treasure. <laughs>